Recording in progress. It sounds very <laughs> official. You can keep track. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone. I'm June Helderhouse. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. Coming today, and we are broadcasting this on Zoom, so we have a couple attendees who are on there. So that's what some of this equipment is about. If you were curious, um, and hopefully we won't have any snafus with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce Jonathan Hawley, the author of the Guardians of the Manitou Passage, who's presenting today. Well, I want to first express my deep appreciation for the invitation today and for uh, the wonderful help that I received in the course of this project uh, from the museum and the staff, and Jim in particular, uh, with respect to many of the photos that appear in the book. Um, the book primarily chronicles the talent, dedication, and sacrifices of the rescue crews serving Lake Michigan Mariners during 17 decades of sail and early steam powered ships from the mid 19th century to 1915. That's the year when the US Coast Guard, another essential federal service with its own great legacy, still broadening responsibilities was established. I have long been interested in Great Lakes matters, perhaps inspired by childhood years when my family lived by the Lake Michigan shore in Evanston, Illinois, and lived in Evanston, or what's over here, just two blocks from Gross Point Lighthouse. And I always vacationed furthermore at Crystal Lake at my grandparents' cottage uh, and picnic at Point Betsy Lighthouse. I mentioned those two lighthouses and you may not know that they share some interesting heritage their identifications being both being traceable to names given to their sites by early French explorers and traders hundreds of years ago. Gross Point meaning Great Point and Point Betsy being first known as Point Opex Seas, which is derived from the name of the prevalent species of duck. Each of these stations was established to mark a major shipping course one into Chicago and the other into and through the beautiful Manitou Passage, a key waterway which, which offered both a welcomed refuge and sometimes life-threatening peril. My interest on Lake Michigan coastal matters grew when I served 
10 years on the staff of the U.S. House of Representatives. And when Peggy and I retired year around to Frankfurt just over 20 years ago, I was asked to join the board of the Friends of Point Betsy Lighthouse, then being composed, and served a decade as its vice president and president. This was an exciting opportunity uh, for my retirement, one which took me far and wide, gathering and researching Point Betsy's history in preparation for the rehabilitation of the lighthouse and the depiction for our visitors of the light's 160 plus years of operation, as well as the story of the point's formerly important U.S. life-saving service station. I was determined throughout my tenure to cover both those facilities in a sort of 50% one way, 50% the other fashion, as each that provided unique a service, absolutely vital service, and deserved to be presented as such to our visitors. I decided that a book specifically uh, about Point Betsy could and should evolve from my research, and I was able to achieve that goal in 2008. Looks like such. You remember what Point Betsy looks like down the shore. That's it. And uh, and some of the years later, I uh, came a brief book that I did on the history of Betsy Bay, um, which has the interesting title of subtitle of Betsy Bay's historic quote island unquote story, as there as a, a feature in the harbor which long ago, era about nineteen hundred was we've always referred to as the island. It really never was an island. It was a peninsula from one side of the harbor uh, initially, and then re they reoriented the entrance and it became a peninsula from the other side of the harbor. But it is the island to old timers, you know it as such. I should say that um, I have had, I had three objectives for this particular book, Guardians of the Manitou Passage. I wanted to present that maritime history in a regional context because that's the nature of the Manitou Passage, a famed sailing route linking two adjacent shoreline counties that were originally just one. I also wanted people to know about the essential federal government's vital supervisory role in the creation and operation of the passages, vital navigational facilities. And lastly, I wanted to relate significant accounts of the dedicated lifesaver service as recorded in the daily reports of their officers in charge, that is to say their station keepers, who daily filled out reports of their activities that would be submitted to their commanders and ultimately and to the public. To put my topic in an appropriate historical context, its roots extend back to the opening of the Erie Canal in 1824, through which thousands of, of migrants reached the Great Lakes with Buffalo and Chicago growing rapidly. In 1830, Buffalo was a village of about 8,000 people. 10 years later, it was a city of more than 18,000. And a decade after that, its numbers exceeded 40,000. As one historian has noted of Buffalo, here, boatloads of people and merchandise were collected from the east and transferred to, lake, to vessels going west. It was actually took about two decades before the uh, direction of the majority, the traffic shifted and started going back to the east. Chicago's growth was similarly amazing. 
From just prior to the mid 19th century to 1860, its population rose from less than 30,000 people to make it the newest American city with a population over 100,000. Most of those migrants reached their new homes by sailing like Michigan, then relied on it for both the delivery of the goods they needed and for marketing their products. To use a common historical mar maritime reference, expanding catastrophes ultimately compelled the federal government to invest resources at specific sites over many years in response to the rapidly expanding vessel traffic, crews and passengers that Western migration and settlement brought to the Manitou Passage. Coastal lights to guide navigation had been the initial federal commitment in our region, being erected and gradually upgraded thereafter, first on South Manitou Island in 1839, Grand Traverse at the north end of Leonel Peninsula in 1852, Point Betsy in 1858, North Manitou 1898, initially as a lighthouse, then a series of light ships, and lastly the crib in the middle of the passage. Those light stations and their notable crews, absolutely vital to the economic and demographic growth of the region, have a storied role from the earliest days until the 1980s when Point Betsy Lighthouse, the last manned station on Lake Michigan was automated. The federal government's involvement in Great Lakes lifesaving began in the 1850s when heavy ore powered metallic boats were delivered to various Great Lakes sites where especially needed and could be quickly launched, including the two Manitous, one under the responsibility and care of South Island lightkeeper Alonzo Slyfield, the other under the able protection of Nicholas Picard, who sold wood for the increasing steamers calling at his North Island pier. The boats would be oared to a shipwreck by six or eight very muscular recruits. Their effectiveness depended not only on the availability and willingness of, value, of reliable volunteers to leave their warm beds and or their luringly profitable fishing grounds to row over long distances in stormy seas typical of the fall and spring. The island's uh, boats among the 50 some that were ultimately distributed have always been thought to have been uh, uniquely well cared for. These boats, their assignees and recruits constituted the official rescue force on the lakes for more than two decades until a new federal agency, the US Life Saving Service emerged in the latter 1870s under the extraordinary leadership of a Treasury Department official, Sumner Kimball, the agency's first general superintendent. His potential successors were likely very frustrated as he led the agency for nearly 50 years, essentially its entire history, his goals and achievements drawing respect for our country's expanding life-saving program. Truly a man on a mission, he skillfully fostered public interest in his team's endeavor through every opportunity to showcase its abilities, to expand the public's awareness and knowledge of the importance of this activity. A highlight included the notable construction of an actual life-saving station at the 1876 Centennial in Philadelphia, where a crew demonstrated its re rescue techniques to very enthusiastic audiences. Mr. Kimball reported to Congress in mid-year 1876, this is at the very start of the US Life-Saving Service, that the only so-called complete life-saving stations then going into operation on Lake Michigan. We're at Point Betsy and 60 miles south at Grand Point Osable. Complete meant a station with a wooden surf boat that would be rowed by six resident surfmen steered by the keeper who would recruit and train his men. Bear in mind that men's prior work in this area typically had been on farms 
or in other land-based pursuits. And an isolated and risky life um, was uh, rather new to them. In addition to his recruitment, surf, uh, surfman training and boat management roles, a complete station was keeper was responsible for the maintenance of the station's entire property and equipment for any items recovered from a wreck and for evaluating the crew's performance in its daily drills on land and lake to raise them to the standards demanded by Superintendent Kimball and his visiting inspectors. For years, a complete stations keeper was paid $200 a year. While his surfman received $40 a month during the eight month, the stations on the lakes were generally active and the men resided there. Hence the keeper in charge of the station made less money than his men did. A situation about which Kimball constantly complained to Congress. Kimball sought again and again for more support for his services personnel as evidenced by this appeal reflecting the recruitment challenge. And I quote him here. Heroes on 93 cents a day, that's after the men allocated 40 cents for their board from their day's pay of $1.33. Kimball worried that especially if they have large families to support, however full of human kindness or prone to daring exploits, they will inevitably yield to the plump $2 or the fat $4 per diem of the lake schooner or steamer, he warned, adding, with the flesh pots of the cook's galley thrown in by way of garnish. The consequence is that all the best men, he wrote, will be drawn from the stations by the Lake Marine, forcing the employment of raw, crude, unskilled, or commonplace surfmen to fill the deserted places. You can see that Kimball and his Washington wordsmiths truly had a way with their raw material those reports in from the field. Incidentally, the purchasing power of $40 and $200 in the mid 1870s that I quoted would today be about $1,000 and $5,100. So compensation to both keepers and surfmen was hardly lavish. As stations were situated close to or shared, lighthouse grounds, there was another dimension to the keeper's own compensation issue. And here again in, in Kimball's words, on bad nights, the keeper, a brave life faithful man is out with the patrols to make sure that there is no shirking. On him rests the unceasing care to see that the work is done, to shore up the underpaid, perhaps disheartened men to the nightly task of risking health, life, and limb in the watch for ships in danger. At Rex, as in a recent instance, he takes the steering oar and guides the surf boat through miles of sea, which makes the boldest crew white. For all this, $400 a year. Meanwhile, $800 a year and two assistants at $400 each for the adjacent light keeper ensconced aloft in his solid chamber near the lens when death and tempest walked the strand with the patrolman. It took unceasing such appeals to wrest increases from Congress to $700 a year for a keeper in the mid 1880s and eventually to $1,000. A few more comments about the mandated beach nightly patrols are in order, which of course ran from 8 p.m. to midnight, from midnight to 4 a.m., from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. The men carrying a lantern and two flares known as costume flares for the inventor. 
by which they would signal a ship too close to shore and thus in serious risk of grounding. Grounding, of course, was the most serious and most common threat to a ship's survival in our part of Michigan. Some statistics I can show this. Between 1893, for example, and 1903, that, that decade, there were 11 recorded strandings at Sleeping Bear Point, 13 at South Manitou, 16 at North Manitou, that, and that total exceeded any other Lake Michigan site. Kimball argued that owing own to patrols as well as the station watch duty, quote, no man ever gets a whole night's sleep during the eight months of station duty. It hardly needs to be said how wearing such a life is to the crews. In terms that we would readily understand, given our ever changing beach conditions, Kimball explained that the patrol's path lies along a waste of foot detaining sand, whereon to walk is to trudge laboriously, frequently ankle deep, at times to stumble over stones or wreckage wood washed up by the sea, or to sink suddenly in spots of quicksand. Often the surf is seething across the path, or the sentinel wades knee deep into the bays beyond, or into deep cuts which trench into the sand hills. The fitful lights and shadows of a lantern alone mark the somber, the somber way. To this challenging nighttime chore must be added the typical weekly daytime ritual, practice with beach rescue apparatus and overhaul the gear if necessary, practice with the station's rescue craft, typically a surf boat, and ultimately a larger lifeboat, maintain them in working can order, signal practice, practicing the resuscitation of the apparently drowned, cleaning the house and readying it for inspection. I think you get the idea of what life-saving service in the latter 19th and early 20th century involved. But let me share with you a few examples from my text at the, at the passage stations. First of all, uh, about uh, the rescue of the Ida, of the Ida Keith on April 10 and 1880. On April 10, only days after North Manitou Island Station opened for the season, and this is very early in the history of the, of the station, the Chicago-based schooner Ida Keith, crewed by nine men, was sailing to Buffalo with a load of corn when she stranded on shallows about four plus miles south of the station during a northeastern gale-blown snowstorm. The lifesavers went down the shore where they could see what was needed, returned to the station, gathered their equipment, and headed back to the schooner by surfboat. As the service subsequently reported, the captain of the vessel sent word ashore on a shingle that he did not wish to land, but desired a boat to be sent out to him. Two shots, from the loud gun were fired, the second being successful. That is to say the projectile had carried the line to the schooner and the boat was pulled part way out by the line, which then parted and the boat then drifted back to the shore. By this time, it was too dark to fire another shot. The life-saving crew then built a fire and patrolled the beach until morning. Prepared to fire another shot, the crew received a message by shingle again from the captain of the schooner requesting them to await the quieting of the sea. At 10 a.m., the storm fortunately lulled, and soon afterward, the life-saving crew rowed out and landed the ship's crew, and the vessel was subsequently got off. In short, the sailors aboard the schooner were saved. As well as the cargo and vessel, no surfmen were injured or lost. It was not the most dramatic rescue uh, by far, but it was one of the earliest surviving accounts by the North Manager crew. Uh, crew. It would not always be the case, nor would such activities be a daily feature uh, of any 
of their station or any other. But now I would like to turn to you uh, to turn to uh, the rescue of the J. Hartzell, which is a schooner. This occurred almost exactly six months after the Ida Keith, uh, and it's down uh, near Frankfurt. On her trip down from Lance in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, the Hartzell is said to have enjoyed favorable winds until, short, until anchoring off Frankfurt in the wee hours of the morning. She was loaded with 495 tons of iron ore to be delivered to the Frankfurt Furnace Community com Company inside the town's harbor. Exercising reasonable caution, her captain decided to wait for daylight before trying to sail into the harbor through its narrow pier line channel. However, a rapid wind shift from gentle southeast to gale force southwest blasts accompanied by a mix of snow, hail, and rain, dealt his plan a fatal blow. An attempt to sail the ship to safety further offshore failed, owing to the rapidly deteriorating wind and sea. As the service's narrative relates, she would not obey her helm and began to drift in, seeing which her master let go both anchors and set his signal of distress. But she continued to drag and soon struck upon the middle bar, about 300 yards from shore, where she was hard aground, her bow toward shore. Then the seas at once crashed over her and the awful staving and rendering usual in such cases began. The vessel was described as being directly a beam of a range of wooded sand hills or bluffs almost precipitous and several hundred feet high, known as big and little bald hills. The yawl, the ship's dinghy, was carried away. The deck cabin wrenched to asunder and scattered to the breakers and the vessel began to founder. In a couple of hours, all that remained for her crew was to take to the rigging. Lydia Dale, a cook who was aboard possibly as a passenger rather than working the trip had been seriously ill. The service's official account continues as the ship began to break up. She was very weak and it took the united efforts of four men to get her aloft into the cross trees of the foremast, across which planks had been made. Upon this species of platform she lay, wrapped up as well as possible with her head supported on the knees of one of the sailors, and as they stated, rapidly grew delirious. A little while after the men had got aloft, the vessel sank in 16 feet of water, the stern resting upon the bar and the forward part in deeper waters. Later, the mainmast gave away and went over, remaining attached to the foundered hulk by some of the cordage and thrashing and plunging alongside with every rush of the seas. The foremost with the man upon it, one of, with the men upon it, one of them, the captain, clinging to the ratlines about 10 feet above the water, the remainder 50 feet aloft in the cross trees with the recumbent woman swayed and creaked ominously, some of the wedges have, having become loosened and seemingly likely to go over at any moment. As the service reported, it was a horrible feature of the shipwreck that the vessel, now in utter re, re, uh, ruin, had a short time before been loitering to and fro in a fresh breeze with no anticipation of disaster. So suddenly and fiercely had the tempest arisen that with it, within an hour it had destroyed her and placed in deadly jeopardy the lives of the wretched com company that clung to her one tottering spot. The wreck could soon be seen from the town and a young boy, the son of a fisherman whose family lived in a cabin close to the South Pier, was one of the first to see the ship and told his father about it. The father immediately rushed to the village of South Frankfurt, on the other side of the uh, harbor there, spreading the word. Many residents joined him in getting atop the hills to where they could better see the wreck. As the crowd arrived opposite the stricken vessel, they laid driftwood along the dune's face, 
spelling a message of hope to the victims abroad, life boat coming. Meanwhile, a young man named Woodward start, had started on horseback for the distant Point Obex Seas, that's the original name, Point Betsy, um, station. When thus informed, Keeper Matthews ordered out the beach car and rescue apparatus. Soon thereafter, the car containing the Lyle gun, breeches, buoy, hawser, hauling lines, and other essentials left the station, dragged by the horse. Fortunately, they had the horse with five lifesavers <clears throat> helping to move the heavily loaded car as rapidly as possible. The station's sixth lifesaver, who was making his beach patrol, would join the rescue party as it moved toward the scene. And the, the account continues, the expedition had set out upon a terrible journey. The Point Obex Sea Station is upon the lake shore north of Frankfurt, south of which town the wreck lay and the intervening river and the harbor piers making out into the lake from the town made it impossible in any case to arrive at the wreck by following the line of the coast. The only way was to make a circuit through the woods and around the rear of the town where the bisecting river could be crossed by a bridge in that locality with the beach of, and so the beach south of Frankfurt could be gained. The shortest route from the station, not less than seven or eight miles long, this was necessary to travel two miles from the, uh, along the beach. And the beach was now submerged by a swashing flood, constantly bursting and washing against the steep banks of the lakeshore, battering the escarpment with intertangled masses of logs, stumps, and trees, and of course, rendering the way impossible. The expedition was therefore compelled to lengthen the detour by taking an old trail or cart track, which had been pioneered by the Point Obetsi Lighthouse construction party several years before for the, uh, to transport materials. This road wandered through the woods along winding ravines and up steep, soggy sand hills. Across these activities, the way was so difficult that the men and the horse tugging and straining at the cart could only make 10 or 15 yards at a pull without pausing. This violent toll was pursued amidst the roaring of the gale, which now blew almost a hurricane and the rushing of a storm until about a mile's distance from the station had been accomplished. By this time, the men, despite the bitter cold, were hot and wet with their efforts, and the horse, streaming with exertion, trembled on his limbs and could scarcely draw. There were at least nine miles more of their disheartening journey before them, and the party was already sorely spent. Reaching a road didn't offer the men much relief, as the difficulties of an ordinary country road in the rougher regions of the West, as described, were quite indescribable, and thus far the way was not even a road, but a rude cart trail made years before, encumbered here and there with fallen trunks of trees. The account notes that the load of rescue equipment being dragged by the men and the horse through ruts, etc., weighed a thousand or more pounds, and to make matters worse, they faced constant driving rain and snow. However, they were lucky to I encounter several persons who were willing to help, one with a horse and a buggy, it to get to the site more quickly, and another with a team of horses whom he directed to proceed to the station and bring its life car and other items to the scene. So struggling through woods, ravines, and other barriers, this valiant party, amazingly covering approximately 10 miles in about two hours, reached Frankfurt Harbor going around that basin, if you know M22, going around the, the east side of town, um, and only to face uh, the, the dunes on the other side. The account proceeds. The party followed the keeper through a ravine about a, a, a distance of a quarter of a mile. The way then led up the overhanging hillside through the brush and the tug with a loaded cart was terrible. 
so sleep, so steep was the ascent that man and beast had fairly to climb and almost to hoist the cart after them. Nothing could have been done, but for the aid of a crowd of sturdy townsfolk who had assembled there and anticipating the arrival of the life-saving party had cleared away with axes and hand spikes a great deal of the undergrowth and fallen trees. It took the efforts of 27 strong men, including the life-saving crew and town volunteers, helped by several horses, to pull the loaded apparatus cart to the summit. Another challenge awaited them there, a line of woods and numerous fallen trees that blocked their way across the summit to the shore's side. In the, wor in the report's words, the obstacle seemed to inspire all present with a sudden electric energy and given and gave occasion for a striking and admirable scene. In an instant and by a simultaneous impulse, all hands, citizens and crew flung themselves upon the wood with axes and hand spikes and a work began which resembled a combat. In some places, men were showering terrible blows with axes upon standing timber. In others, they were prying and lifting aside great fallen trees with all their branches, shouting in chorus. In an incredibly short period of time, the way through the wood was cleared and the mortar cart loaded with apparatus was dragged forward to the brow of the hill. The rescuers then, rescuers then confronted one more dilemma, getting that heavy cart down the, the face of the dune without losing control of it to a more level spot from which its contents could be utilized. Storm was blowing sand up the slope, mix of snow and rain falling. They spotted a ledge about 250 feet down the slope where it would be possible to mount a rescue attempt. And uh, if effort was made to uh, get it down without careening the rest of the way. When the line that was helping to restrain the descent proved to be too short, it was quickly released from the fallen tree to which it had been tied, and men grabbed a hold of it, kept their feet in the sand to create drag, and rode the load to its destination. The cart was quickly unloaded, the Lyle gun was prepared for firing, and on the second shot, the line fell right across the fore rigging from which the men in the rigging could retrieve it. And after considerable working with lines that were being swept by the rolling sea, breaches buoy operations were ready. Meanwhile, the wreckage was nearly sunken, but fortunately her masts were still standing. The crew aboard could hear them creaking as the hull swayed back and forth, threatening doom for the nearly frozen and seemingly unconscious woman. Given the conditions, particularly the wind vests, Blast. It took considerable time to get the breach's buoy out to the ship's mast. Upon its arrival, a man could be seen getting into the contraption and starting for shore, a process that took 16 minutes. The first person rescued was the ship's mate. The official narrative reads, his jaws were set, his eyes vacantly fixed, and the expression on his face dazed and frightened. He was given brandy that seemed to revive him whereupon he muttered, save the others, before being taken away by townspeople. The report indicates that the woman may have early expressed fear of the breaches buoy, but further use of that device would have presented another problem, as the line to which it would have been attached was slipping in the sand. So Keeper Matthews decided to utilize the life car, which looks like a tobacco a container with a hatch into which people would actually get and be towed up to the shore. So he sent it out to the mast attached to the line that had a uh, result of the breaches buoy firing. And several people could be brought to, brought to shore at a time rather than individually in this fashion. So the life car was attached and hauled out. On its way out to the wreck, it turned turtle but having righted itself, continued to um, lurch wildly. And when it finally reached the hull, the fallen mainmast suddenly rose up on a breaker, smashed down on the car, throwing it 10 to 15 feet in the air. 
miraculously, the men working the line from the shore hauled in the slack and the, and the car then hung perpendicularly about 12 feet below them. With ropes around their waists, two men managed to get down from the cross trees and into the car. Then a third man lowered himself to where he could close the hatch door and the car began its trip back to the shore where they were promptly asked about the woman. The report states that they seem, quote, to have given evasive answers to the general effect that she would come ashore in the next trip of the car. Uh, having been somewhat damaged, uh, damaged from its battering, the car was hammered into shape, sent on its way back to the ship. Her captain could be seen gradually making his way toward his men further up the rigging. The captain made an attempt to rouse the woman, but without effect. Then the second mate and captain managed to get into the car, and it was pulled to shore, and the hatch cover quickly opened. The narrative continues, the crowd was confident that the woman would be brought this time and was stupefied when only the two men appeared. There was an instant burst of fierce interrogation to which the captain and mate appear like their professors, like their predecessors, to have rendered equivocal answers. The effect of their replies was that the woman was the same as death, and that she would be or might be brought to the shore at the next trip. However, that out outcome was not to be realized. The crowd on the shore, having seen people moving about the mass and giving rise to their expectation that the woman would be coming next, eagerly surrounded the car as it again arrived. And when the hatch was open, two more men emerged. A cry of many voices then rose. Where's the woman? It was followed by a momentary silence in which men were seen bent over the open hatch and groping about with their arms inside the car. Then someone shouted to the crowd in a terrible voice, they haven't brought the woman. The dark air resounded with a roar of curses and amidst the din, men were heard yelling that they never would have laid hands to the hauling lines if they had known that the woman was to be left upon the wreck to perish. The rescued men insisted when sharply questioned that the woman was, was dead. And the keeper judged that sending to the car yet again for confirmation of her state posed unacceptable risks to anyone going to the ship. Actually, the, tr the outcome of this has remained ever since in a state of debate. It is true that her body was found about three weeks later, uh, whereupon the coroner determined that she had drowned. Uh, however, um, there is a general consensus that she was in a state, if alive, where she in no way would she have been able to assist her, the men to get her into the life car that I described and to save her. Nonetheless, the thing about that story is that it contains so many aspects of what a life-saving service rescue has, uh, what it involves. Now, Manitou Passage Keeper's writing provide windows to view not only the services of their crews to Lake Michigan sailors, but also to the nature of residential life on the isolated islands of Northern Lake Michigan shoreline. Here are some varied examples that reveal the surfman's role. They were truly the emergency responders of their time and place. They, whom injured, ill, or otherwise, threatened folks would call for help. So on May 16th in 1885, the North Manitou crew was alerted by a resident to a fire in the woods about a mile from the station. Surfmen took every bucket they had and worked for six hours to distinguish the flames, saving houses and barns, a resident later noting that everything would have been swept away but for the crew. Another service that the residency islands clearly depended on was the mail, 
Weeks would sometimes pass when the famous do rain, sleet, and snow tradition would be interrupted by prohibitively dangerous lake conditions. And you can't imagine the number of times in the records when the island surfmen went into action to save the mail boat, hauling it from its mooring being battered by a heavy sea onto the beach to protect it. Sometimes an occupant from stormy conditions or even an empty fuel tank or a mechanical breakdown when an offshore wind was pushing a mail boat toward the wide and dangerous open lake from which rescue was unlikely. Point Betsy's crew in 1896 was called to an interesting challenge by a station neighbor saying his horse had fallen into a well. The crew responded to his request with shovels and tackle, and after much digging, they were able to rescue this valuable and presumably petrified animal. Calls for medical assistance were not uncommon, as in 1905, when the South Island crew was asked to accompany a fish tug to Glenhaven to bring a physician to the island. If the lifesavers were would also make the trip, the doctor apparently would be assured of his safety. They did so, and they returned him to the mainland after he had treated a dangerously ill woman who had given birth. In another example, an island keeper sewed up a badly cut crewman's face. Such valued services were common. There were also numerous, uh, there were also numerous times in the island station's later years when the surfman performed a sort of marine taxi service, kind of like Uber drivers today, ferrying visitors or travelers to and from lake steamers who sounded their horns to signal that seas were too dangerous for them to reach their wharves. Well, I'd like to close, if I could, uh, these remarks with the story of one other important rescue. The Hartzell rescue, and the one I'm about to tell you in, in more summary fashion, are two of the most honorable, uh, highly regarded stories from the US Life Saving Service's great history. This is the story of the rescue of the steamer St. Lawrence, which was carrying grain from Chicago to Prescott, Ontario in November of 1898. You may already be familiar with some of it, but because it embodies so much of the life saving spirit, this reminder is appropriate. The steamer had passed Frankfurt and was headed to pass Point Betsy's stations and head into the passage when she was pounded by some 22 inches of snow on that single night and driven off course into dreaded shallow bars about 350 yards offshore. Her captain reportedly had ordered her whistle sounded. But since the pattern was not one of distress, the surfman at the point hearing the blasts thought she was most likely coming from an Ann Arbor car ferry that was trying to make her way into Frankfurt. But concerned that the ferry might have missed the harbor's narrow entry and could be driven too close to shore by the powerful wind and waves, the keeper sent his number one surfman, his, his top man, down the beach, prepared to warn her off by a flare. The surfman traced the whistle blasts as he hustled down the beach, but he couldn't see the vessel's lights on account of the heavy snowfall until he was actually abreast of her, where he fired two constant flares. Hearing no response, he hurried back to the station to alert his crew to an apparent grounding in which the ship could be destroyed. The keeper sent a surfman to a neighboring farm to obtain a team of horses to haul the heavy equipment through the snow-covered beach while his crew readied the surf boat's own wagon to be pulled to, pulled to the wreck site. Upon reaching the stranded vessel, they promptly tried to go to her by boat, but a breaking wave dashed their surf boat as they crossed the second bar. Returning to the beach, the keeper sent crewmen with the horses to haul the beach apparatus. Conditions were simply too dangerous to undertake a rescue by surf boat. 
Two cart trips were necessary on account of the storm, obstructions on the beach, and the weight of the equipment in the sand. On his second trip, the surfman, stopping to light his lantern, spotted a man staggering toward him, described as wet, weak, and scarcely able to stand. He feebly reported that he and others had left the steamer in her yawl, which had immediately turned over, and he urged the surfman to leave him and search for his shipmates. Three men were subsequently found, and after the beach apparatus was removed from the cart, it was used to transport the exhausted sailors to the station where the crew's spouses would nurse, cook, and care for them without compensation. Number one surfman soon found another man from the steamer lying on the water's edge. He dragged him higher on the beach and began resuscitation, but could see that success was not feasible. The victim bore ghastly wounds, likely having been battered to death by the overturned yawl, a victim of the mate's foolish claim on the steamer that he could reach shore in the yawl without wetting his feet. From this situation, there follows one of the most heroic rescues in Great Lakes history, beginning with an amazing virtually blind Lyle gun shot from the beach to the stranded vessel. The lifesavers were unable to see their results through the snow and were retrieving the line for yet another attempt when they realized that with each pull that they made, trying to pull the line and coil it back up, the ship's whistle sounded. Their shot had draped across the ship's own whistle cord so that when they pulled on it, they caused sound blasts, blasts that actually alerted the ship that a rescue attempt was being mounted. Using that line connection, a stronger hawser line was attached and sent to the vessel with the initial intention of deploying the breaches buoy apparatus to haul the wreck victims to shore. However, the conditions were then judged too dangerous for that strategy in which the rider might be frozen or drowned. The keeper settled on another tactic to bring the shipment to shore uh, by surf boat, not by rowing to them, which was simply impossible, but by the surfman and himself going hand over hand to and from the ship, holding onto the overhead draped a, a, a line to main control of the boat that they're riding in and avoid swamping in the freezing waves. Several trips were required to ferry all of the remaining still on board. This ordeal later being described by survivors as simply one of the most heroic acts that any of them ever saw. Mindful of one of the sailors, of the one sailor's death, the keeper whose boating skills were widely respected by his superiors and colleagues said, quote, he would never understand how anyone would try to reach shore in a small boat in such conditions. So I thank you for your attention and for this wonderful opportunity and I welcome your questions. Any questions for me? Well, oh, I would, yeah. What was the most surprising thing that you discovered? <laughs> um, well, I did a lot of it, I can tell you. So you run upon, I think, uh, rather than one single thing, I, I would say, um, being able to look at the actual daily reports, and this I did at the National Archives over many trips, uh, 
the original reports as written, some of them in pencil, some of them in ink, ultimately, thank God, on a typewriter, because they are really difficult to read. Uh, nonetheless, how thorough those reports are every single day. And now some days, of course, really not much happens. And, and there's boredom and there's um, discouragement, but you're always on the ready. Um, uh, but the, and the reports fill, tell you exactly which surfman walked which patrol every single day uh, and at night, uh, who was at lookout, or anything unusual that happened that day, the weather conditions uh, on that day. Uh, and I think the important thing is that the um, Sumner Kimball is the man I described, the general superintendent worked up a system where he could manage this emerging federal service and did so for almost 50 years uh, by recruiting uh, capable individuals in the local environments where they dis determined stations were needed who would be who would be keepers who would be in, responsible for those stations but who would be expected to locally find the recruits and give them the training that they needed in order to survive at the task that they were undertaking i think that i was enormously impressed by the challenge that those people faced i wasn't so surprised as i was impressed about what those men undertook and how successful they were. And I've just given you a thumbnail sketch of what it was like. And I tried to pick episodes that would sort of describe in totality the kind of mission that was theirs. Thank you. I'm not gonna take anybody out, but Sure. With, with just one additional comment that I would make, and that is um, someone asked about visiting. Yeah, I would urge you to go to visit Point Betsy if you haven't done so, particularly in the last, say, half a dozen years, <clears throat> because in that period, we in sort of a unique situation in terms of uh, lighthouses and life-saving stations, uh, historic presentations. We have been able to build a whole new museum uh, and equip it in a fashion to illustrate much of what I've talked about today. Uh, and it's, it is uh, well worth a visit. Thank you.